everyone to track one. This is the last talk just before lunch. We would like to welcome Seth Law. Um, I had the absolute pleasure of being on Seth and Ken's training course for the last two days, where we're doing excellent adventures in source code review. Fantastic course. Um, so Seth um, is from the Absolute Security Podcast as well. Has over 15 years experience in security, but if you asked his uh, better half, Ken, he says he's got 80 years. So, um, Something like that. But today we're going to go with Domo Arigato, Mr. Rimoto. Sorry for my Japanese. And um, we're going to talk about security unit testing. So take care. All right. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good day so far, right? We, we have some caffeine in us. Okay, we're not going to review as much code as we did for those of you that were in my course, right? At least we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about code rather than you know, looking at, at too much of it. So this is Domo Arigato, Mr. Roboto, security robots a la unit testing. Uh, by way of introduction, Pam gave a little bit of it. Um, I'm Seth Law. Uh, a little while ago, somebody was coming to Salt Lake City, this is where I'm from, and said that I looked like the guy from Mr. Robot. So if there's any confusion, I'm the one on the left, not the one on the right, okay? Just in case you, you didn't know, you know who was here. <laughs> okay. No, but seriously, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, um, I've been doing security work for 15 plus years. I actually started as a developer, a Java developer. Anybody here remember iOmega? Yes, I'm old. Zip drives? Okay, there we go, zip drives. Okay, the click of death was not me. That was a problem with the engineering side. I did Java development on the web side. That wasn't me. Um, I, I currently work, or I currently run a firm, Redpoint Security, that's just me doing security consulting. Uh, I've been doing that for about a year, but I've, I've bounced around between industry and consulting uh, over the course of my career. I, I do create the iOS application for DEF CON, known as Hacker Tracker. Um, no, it doesn't actually track the hackers. If you ask us about it on, on the App Store or something like that, we're not going to hack anyone or track anyone for you. Okay. Uh, soccer, I enjoy soccer. Uh, if you want to talk about you know, Man City versus Man United or something like that, we can do it at a later date. Over beers this afternoon, right? That's, <laughs> that's typically where soccer stuff goes. Today we're going to talk about security unit testing. Now, I, I, I just want to, you know, quick gauge of the room. How many of you here are developers? Awesome. This is great. Okay, how many here are like pen testers, security people? All right. Okay, so we've got some that do both. That's great. Okay, so if you do pen testing, cover your ears for a minute. No one's covering their ears. Okay. Um, from a developer perspective, penetration testers are glorified QA engineers. I'm just going to say it. And not only are they glorified, they're really bad at coverage and they're bad at analytics, right? They just, like, it's great that, they, that we do security testing and we do dynamic testing, um, but we don't have the discipline on the security side that we probably should. And that's kind of the impetus of this whole talk. Uh, that's where it came from is that, you know, as we're developing different products from a security perspective and trying to test them like, like developers do and should, we found that there's things that we could do from a security perspective, there's payloads that we can use, there's approaches that we can take that we can, uh, that we can copy from the QA playbook that actually make more sense than stepping outside of the development process and running a separate security testing team. Uh, so that's the whole idea behind the talk and what we're going to be doing today. That's why we're talking about security testing. Yes, you already run security tests, but you know there's other things that we can do, and there's a better approach that we should be taking as you know penetration testers or even developers in running those security tests. <clears throat> so. Um, in addition to this, right, I, you, you always get the compliance people to come, that come to you as developers or security people that are looking for some sort of a security scan or some sort of assurance that your application does not have any security vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Um, but this leads to this weird dichotomy where the security goals don't always equal the development go goals, that don't always equal the business goals. And... That's what we're that's what we're going to try and match back up. The security tools that are out there, I would argue, are also pretty weak from a development perspective. 
Uh, they don't support what we need as developers to actually test and reliably you know, unit test or integration test our applications. Um, the business goals are at odds with full coverage security testing. Uh, you know, those of you that are security uh, you know, penetration testers, how often have you been given a carte blanche, hey, just go find every vulnerability in this application? Any, any time has that ever happened? Okay. Kudos bug bounty program. Okay, kudos bug bounty program. So that, that is one situation that's changed over the last couple of years. You know, as, as someone embedded on a product security team or as a consultant, I typically get, hey, here's a, you know, two million lines of code. I've been talking a lot about code reviews lately. And here's, you know, 10 days. <laughs> Go find all the security bugs. Uh, that's just not possible. So we're going to talk about automating this and how we can actually use a, a smarter approach to do this using these TDD, like the test group driven tools, test-driven development tools, and your CI CD pipeline. Okay, flaws, not exploits. Why would I say this? Any thoughts? All security bugs are really just flaws in the code. Yeah, yeah, security bugs are just flaws in the code. And as a developer, do I really care if you can dump my entire database? No, I don't. All I care about is I have, an, I have a problem with input handling and parameterized queries on my SQL statement. And that's what I need to go fix. Uh, same thing goes with something like cross-site scripting. You know, yes, it, it's great that someone can you know, run an alert box or whatever on my site, but that's a full exploit. I don't really care that the full exploit chain works. What I'm concerned about is the flaw that exists that I need to go fix. Um, and so I'm proposing that in, in our testing methodology, we don't need to do a full exploit. All we need to do is identify, identify the flaw and actually go fix it. Let's sh short circuit this process a little bit because we're not as concerned about the whole, the whole ex exploit chain. We're not going to, a, you know, as a developer, I'm not going to a security conference to actually look for, uh, you know, exploits. I just really want to know what's in my code, how do I fix it, and how do I make it better? And that's easily done with flaws and not with a full exploit. Okay, so we're going to create a, a bunch of little bots that go and find these flaws. That's really what's going to happen, uh, and they're going to report back to us whether or not there's a you know there's a, an error condition in our in our test. <clears throat> so the agenda, right? Uh, and I will talk a little bit about how this uh, like. The tool that I've developed came to be, uh, you know, it's not as robust as it probably needs to be when we get to that end, that's sputter here. Uh, but realistically, we're gonna look at the current, this current state of security testing tools that are out there. We get better, we get faster, uh, but then, you know, we have all these other technologies flowing at us as well. Uh, we'll talk about unit testing frameworks from a kind of a development perspective, what exists out there, what we can actually use. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the requirements for security unit testing, the approach that we should be taking, and then the small tool that I've developed that's helped a niche of what, you know, some things that I've had to, to solve with my own programs. Okay, so who here has used a dynamic scanner before for testing? There's a few people. What about a static scanner? All right, good. So we know what these are. Uh, this, the current tools target specific needs in the SDLC. Uh, they identify vulnerabilities and they attempt to reduce false positives. They're typically, you know, somewhat easy-ish to use, but hard to absorb. Uh, you think about the output from most tools and what do you get from a consulting firm after we come in? You get a PDF. That's not really useful when you're trying to do some sort of a test or like reproduce the the exploit or the vulnerability that they've identified. It takes a little bit to actually push that into your own pipeline. Uh, these tools are often driven by compliance needs. Uh, we saw an explosion in static analysis tools because of PCI, right? <clears throat> Does everybody here know what uh, PCI is, the payment card industry, like their data security standard that they released that basically said, hey, if you wanna accept credit cards, one of the restrictions for any code that's gonna do that is it has to go through you know, uh, either a dynamic penetration test or it has to be statically analyzed using a source code scanner. Uh, 
Uh, and so we saw an explosion of static analysis tools and everyone, everyone that had one built security rules around it and then released them, but there, there's issues with that. So both static and dynamic tools can be useful and they are useful in certain scenarios, but it is very driven by compliance in some cases. My clicker doesn't want to work. <clears throat> If we look at a, you know, a shortened SDLC, uh, the tools kind of fit in these different phases, static up towards, or towards the left, right, the analysis design implementation phase. Uh, although we do run it at other times as well, dynamic tools targeted more towards testing and maintenance. Uh, but realistically, it looks a lot like this, right? Just a, a barren wasteland of development with a couple places that we happen to throw security in. Uh, obviously, this is not ideal. We always talk about building security into the software development lifecycle. We want, you know, we want security requirements up front. We want security to be a feature. But without the tools to support that in our pipeline, it doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, the dynamic tools, uh, if you haven't used one before, this is just a short rundown. Um, examples of a dynamic tool. What have you used before? Arachne? Yeah. Anything else? Burp yeah, Burp Suite, Scanner. Zap Proxy. Zap Proxy. Um, you, you guys are you know, listing the, 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 I guess the inexpensive options, right? These, these are all great, right? <laughs> these are ones that we can go and actually use. Oh, I mean, from OWASP, Zap is great, and Burp Suite is very inexpensive. We use it as manual. That's the manual proxy and the scanner that we end up using a lot in kind of the professional side of things. Um, uh, the big, you know, the big names have them. HP has Web Inspect. Um, IBM has AppScan, uh, but they are pretty costly. They're typically implemented by the security engineers, just because it is it is kind of outside the development um, <clears throat> the development life cycle. Right later in the cycle is when it happens, and it's that glorified QA integration test, but it doesn't give us the full coverage, and it doesn't necessarily tell us how much of the application it's actually tested. Static tools, on the other hand, we have a much better idea about how much of the code it's, has been touched because it has the full code base. Uh, uh, it's typically implemented by developers or build engineers. Uh, what, what static analyzers have you used in the past? I know, uh, Coverity, right? Yeah, there we go, Coverity. Veracode, that one you upload. What? Rips. Say that again? Rips. Oh, Rips, yep. Spot bugs. Spot bugs, yeah. I, you've got your oh, you've got your HP Fortify check marks, AppScan source. We've, we've, we heard of these before. The developers in the room, yes, no, nods. Does someone need coffee or do we need? I know it's super interesting, right? Um, actually, I, you know, I'm excited about it, obviously. But uh, so this is like static analysis tools are typically a cross between a functional and an integration test. Uh, they'll do some, like Veracode and some of the others will require a full, you know, binary build and they'll trace the AST uh, and actually attempt to, you know, identify dangerous input and output where that goes and whether or not that can be vulnerable to different, you know, different exploits, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it is, if you've used them before, uh, what's the... What's the big weakness here? Well, I guess we have some strengths that we got to talk about first. Um, you know, typically the fact that it does meet the compliance needs. We've got speed of setup. Uh, usually it's kind of easy. It just depends on the application, how, how hard it is to build it. Um, it does identify vulnerabilities with those known exploits and payloads. They do fall down in certain situations, though, right? Uh, realistically, a lot of these are just regular expression engines. That's what they came up from. That's where it started. And then they built an AST to do the, the, the dangerous uh, source to sync tracing. Um, from a weakness perspective, have you seen a report from Fortify or from any of these tools? Yes? No? False positives. False positives. Yes. That's, that, that's our biggest problem here there is that the amount of vulnerabilities that come out of this, it, the, a, a tool does not have a lot of context. It just doesn't. It doesn't know what the application does. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, you'll see some of them that try and classify that in some range. Oh, is this an externally available application? All right, then they, they concentrate on other vulnerabilities or they kind of classify the vulnerabilities as what, 
what should be looked at, uh, but without a human that's going in there and actually classifying it and looking at the, at the, the vulnerabilities, they, you never quite know whether or not that's going to be valid, right? From a tool perspective, you just don't. Uh, and I mean, I've gotten reports before out of like AppScan source. Granted, this was probably like five, maybe even like 10 years ago at this point, where you know, the first pass of an application, it comes back to me with 140,000 findings. Scan the code for you know 24 hours and comes back with 140,000 findings. What, what am I going to do with that report as a developer? It's going to go straight into the bit bucket, right? I may scan it for a couple of things that I'm interested in, but most of that, because of the amount of findings that it's spitting back out of out at me, I, it's just not consumable. I can't do anything with it. Um, the false negatives as well, due to generic identification of vulnerabilities through explo exploitation payloads, like they've got very specific uh, payloads that they push to an application uh, and anything else outside of that, it may give you false, a false sense of security that your application is not vulnerable to something. <clears throat> and then um, edge cases are often ignored because of the timing needs. Right? Uh, we only have so much time to actually implement these tools. And then if you think about running, like I mentioned, you know, app scan source, if it takes 24 hours to scan a full code base, is that realistic within a you know, CI CD pipeline where you're pushing out, you know, 10 to 15 times a day? No, I, I, this, that's almost a complete waste. By the time you actually have scanned that code, it could have changed so much that you're gonna have to scan it again. You're never gonna catch up. Cost. Cost is huge here. Uh, the, the amount uh, that HP and IBM charge for these tools, I, like I can't, you know, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat insane, right? <clears throat> anyway, okay. So that's the security testing tools. Any questions on security testing tools? No, all right. <clears throat> Unit testing frameworks. How often do you open a code base and this is what you see? This never happens, right? As developers, we always like write our security unit tests and, or we already always write our unit tests in general. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we talked about this a little bit uh, during the code review training that we gave, but um, the, the indications that are given to the security team when unit tests don't exist are basically that the application, this is gonna be, I mean, from my perspective, it's like, okay, this is gonna be fun. Not only from a, you know, integration and just like getting the application running perspective, but also if they're not writing unit tests, it's gonna fall down in more ways than one. <clears throat> that's, you know, that's really what's going to happen. And it also means that that whole CI CD pipeline is probably not what it needs to be. Uh, there's gotta be some sort of test in there to actually pass and push. Uh, but that does, that's not always the case. So uh, originally a couple years ago, I was helping develop kind of a training framework where um, developers would come and learn how to do secure coding in a specific language. And as part of that, we wanted them to actually fix the code. So we'd give them a vulnerable application. They'd go in and make changes to it. Oh, look, there's SQL injection. We'll go and parameterize those queries. But then that code would be submitted back to us via Git, and we were gonna scan it to actually check and make sure that the vulnerabilities no longer existed. They understood the concept and actually had made the fix. And so we did a whole bunch of work in these different languages trying to get, this, get these tests working, right? It was very targeted because we knew exactly where SQL injection exists. But I still have to be able to exercise a unit framework for you know, Java.net, Rails, Django, uh, even iOS, right, and, and Android to actually test whether or not that vulnerability still existed. Uh, and so that's where this, that's where the, like, the exploration into the different frameworks and what they supported started from, right? Uh, all languages have support for some, or usually have you know, some sort of built-in scaffolding for testing. Uh, you create a new project in Java and it'll build out a unit test you know, portion for you, but it's still up to you to actually go in and fill it out. Uh, these include everything from mock controllers, third-party libraries to test runners. 
Uh, and it goes everywhere from the low-level unit testing to complete integration testing. I know we call that, you know, I call these security unit tests, but realistically, we're we're talking more about an integration test when we're we're doing this sort of an analysis. Uh, Java unit testing, first of all, uh, if we're using Java Spring, uh, we can test without, without full Spring or other containers using some of the mock objects and environments. Um, obviously, if you're doing unit testing, you probably have, have run into this before. Uh, also includes those basic reflection tests, so we can, you know, we have access to any level of of the MVC if we want to look at different objects to make sure that it is what we expect. Come on. Yeah, so it means you can interact with any piece. Uh, we, like, this makes it really easy from a, you know, if we think about just like a simple SQL injection uh, test, right, what we want to see, uh, we, you know, we add some data, we want to see what goes into the database, whether or not that's succeeded, um, and then we also want to see what the error message is that's being returned and it, whether or not, you know, the SQL was, was executed proper, properly, right? Um, so it's very easy to do in this case because we have a full spring environment. We have access to the JD, you know, via JDBC uh, to, or ORM to the database. And let's see, it provides all the context. I mean, basically there's everything here that we need to actually interact and figure out whether our security test was successful or it failed. Um, ASP.NET MVC is very similar. Um, the unit test framework directly calls those MVC, MVC controller methods, but it's not necessarily available in all versions of Visual Studio. And then if you start talking about Mono and some of those other like open source frameworks, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you're using a completely different you know, unit testing library. Um, let's see. Yep, you can, you can mock everything up, but there's a problem here. There's no access to the actual rendered HTML built into the main uh, .NET MVC unit testing framework. Why would this be a problem from a security perspective if I'm testing for security vulnerabilities? What's one of the biggest, like, what do we always hear about uh, on the web as far as a big vulnerability? I mean, there's SQL injection and then there is... There we go. Okay, there's cross-site scripting. So if I can't actually see the HTML the application is rendering, I have no idea if, if it's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. I just won't, right? Um, it also has limited access to HTTP requests and response, so I can't see things like, hey, how are the cookies being set? Or, you know, how is that handling X, Y, and Z in the HTTP headers? That makes it very difficult to actually run a full scope unit, uh, security unit test against a .NET application. In which case, now I have to spin up a whole you know, instance and almost run something like burp, spurp, burp scanner against it to find those vulnerabilities. But again, that's gonna be pretty slow and it's gonna take a lot longer than I want it to. Uh, Django testing is actually very easy. Uh, right? These, I, I like to call them the hipster frameworks and hipster languages. Uh, just because we're in Melbourne, apparently. <laughs> no, uh, just because they're newer, right? But uh, Django and Rails is very easy as well. Uh, it's basically because the, the way that they build it is you've got full access to all the functions, all the URLs from the test framework. It's pretty easy to do. It auto-creates model databases for the test. Uh, they've made it very easy to actually do these security unit tests. Um, and then the test client actually acts as a dummy web browser, so you can do all sorts of things inside of that as well. iOS testing, there's two actually different like frameworks that you can do in iOS. One's the UI Touch, which is basically interacting with the application as it looks on a, in, on a, uh, in the simulator, or the application driver, which gives you access to data and press. So you gotta pick and choose what you're doing within that framework to actually identify the, the security vulnerabilities. Um, unit test frameworks are focused on the low-level functionality, uh, but the integration test frameworks is, is really where we end up spending most of our time from a security perspective uh, because of the fact that it gives us that full stack approach. Okay. All right, so if you were building a security unit test, what do you think your requirements would be from an application perspective? Not necessarily from the tests we're going to build, but from an application perspective. 
you know, we can, what can we do, right? What are, what are the requirements? What does the application have to support? Yeah, it's, testability is exactly what we're looking for, right? Uh, there's gotta be data in there. Yeah. So if we don't have, I mean, if there's no data, there's no reason that we need to access the database or we can't run the, some sort of SQL injection. We gotta be able to log into the application. It's gotta be able to maintain state. I, like realistically, we're talking about a full end kind of like integration test, like full integration test that we would be running. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to inoculate the application in this case against security vulnerabilities, right? Uh, that's the whole idea of security testing in the first place, but we're gonna do it quicker, right? If we're able to inject something slowly in this process, when we're doing, when we're building things in the CI CD pipeline, that means that we won't necessarily be vulnerable to it later or we're gonna cut it off at the head. So inoculation is kind of a good, you know, comparison to what we're doing. Uh, so testability, functional application. It's gotta run in a production light state. Mock and ha have mock or test data, right? Uh, full HTTP request response. You think about the vulnerabilities that exist in a web application or a mobile application, and we've got to have, you know, we've just got to have a full environment to, to test the security of it. Uh, rendered HTML, obviously this comes up with the, the .NET MVC applications. Um, yeah, it's got to maintain some sort of authentication state. If, you, if you're not able to log into the application and see your session tokens, or somehow in that mobile application, you know, do anything with it, then you won't be able to test. Uh, these are the problems that we ran into when we were actually building those training applications is, hey, we quickly need to stand this application up based on the code that the developer is giving us, test it, and then be able to shut it down. So these are all the things that we needed to have in there. We've got it, you know, we've got the full testability, the full application running, uh, but we've got to also be able to maintain the application state. We've got to be able to maintain data within the application. It's got to have some backend that fires up and actually works and include all those different functions that are security relevant, right, that we've tested in the past. Consistent responses, right? Uh, a lot of application vulnerabilities uh, don't necessarily, it's not a single request response, so we gotta be able to track that through. So it's still part of a functional application, but it allows for multiple calls in a single test. All right, so here's a Java Spring example, right? We're building out a um, test runner, right? We're using J, J unit for class, you know, runner, and building out a full test and test web environment, right? That's, that's what we needed. In this case, this is this application's known as Money X, right? Um, it's a vulnerable application, but you know, we're, we're able to inject everything in there and that builds out the application for us as we, we expect to see. Um, ASP.NET becomes a little bit more clunky. Uh, why is this? Anybody here program in you know, ASP.NET? Yeah, okay. Good. Why, why is it more clunky than the, the example that I showed previously? Yeah, it's basically, I just have to, you know, start up IIS Express separately to actually run the application. I can't do this. I can't mock it up easily within, within the code. I've got, to, I've got to start something externally. Django is a lot easier. It, uh, by default, you just say, you know, manage PY test and it'll start up the PY, or you know, start up the write file, and actually start up the application, and then you know, give you a client that you can interact with, and load fixtures very easily. Um, iOS Swift, I'm trying to think if there's anything, you know, in this case, right, we're using XCT assert instead of, uh, you know, there's different, you know, different ways to interact with the application, like I said before. Um, Swift NV is the name of the application that we're dealing with here. Uh, and that's just one of the tests that we're, you know, we're, we're acting on. But, you know, since we, we do have to mock out the application, uh, we've, got to, we've got to use kind of the low level unit test to interact with it, uh, and then actually retrieve data back to test the values. Um, that's where this like add item is. It, and in time, and you know, 
In a lot of these applications, you have to design them with testing in mind. Right? I, we, we already do this from a QA perspective, but a lot of the applications I run into from a security perspective don't necessarily have this same goal, and so it becomes a lot more difficult to perform these sorts of tests. Uh, but we, you know, so we're exposing ad item and things to external entities in the mobile application that you probably, you know, if you're just designing it without tests in mind, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do. Realistically, this is what security unit testing turns into, right? It's, you're just going to bang your head against the wall a whole bunch of times. I can't tell you, you know, how long I would spend just trying to get IIS to spin up properly so I could test it. Um, and or even you know Swift iOS so that I could actually interact with the application, and it it does feel a lot like you're just banging your head against a wall, um, and then it finally works and you get this oh well yeah that you the developer didn't actually fix anything yet right so <clears throat> now the issue here is that. Every single application is different, obviously, and so it's very hard to interpolate this out from .NET to Java to Django to Swift or you know, across the board. Uh, the lessons learned are that you know, every application requires a unique setup, especially for each language and framework. And maybe we'll be able to you know, use the same idea from you know, within that subset or the same test runner, uh, but Realistically, we've got a unique setup because it is very application specific and code specific. Specific, and we spend as much time meeting the requirements as writing the tests. Uh, it takes a long time to get an application to that point that we can actually interact with it like we want to, and it really becomes a combination of dynamic and static security testing. It's not just one or the other. We're doing things like looking in configuration files and you know at. Uh, using reflection to, to look at how the application is configured and also, you know, trying to inject SQL into different parameters. <clears throat> so the approach that we want to take when we're performing these security unit tests, uh, we're, we want to build one security, oh yeah, yep. We need to realize that we're build, that building one security unit test does not make an impenetrable application, right? You've got to keep test from a web application perspective, you've got to test each endpoint, you've got to teach each, each parameter, each vulnerability, and every possible payload against that vulnerability, really. So that becomes math is hard. If we have 10 endpoints, 10 parameters on each endpoint, 10 vulnerabilities on each parameter, five payloads per vulnerability, you know, that becomes what? Becomes nothing? Yeah, there we go. It becomes 5,000 tests, right? And that's just a single endpoint that we're looking at. Um, and then it slowly builds up from there. Uh, and that, this is why it always takes so long. Like you look at a dynamic scanner and it's, you give it you know, a single HTTP request and that request has you know, 20 parameters on it. It's got to test every single endpoint there for all these different vulnerabilities, for all these different payloads for the vulnerabilities, right? Because XSS is not just the single script, script tag. There's all the different variations. Same thing goes with SQL and everything else. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so uh, if we're taking a holistic approach to creating our, you know, our unit tests, what we're going to do is we're going to identify all the endpoints in the application, parameters, flaws, we're going to cre create a test for each one, and then we're going to run the tests. I mean, th this is pretty straightforward, right? Um, Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I need to say much more than this, right? But this is really what it, what it becomes is you're looking for that one needle in the haystack to see whether or not that, that security test actually executed. Now, I, you know, as a security person, if I'm coming to a development team, you know, who knows the application better, me or the developer? Yeah, the developer. I mean, these are the guys that actually wrote the code. They're the ones that are invested in it. They're the ones that are going to be able to find this needle. A way, lot, way quicker than I will, just because I, you know, I, I don't know it the same way. I, I mean, we spent, in the code review class, we spent you know, uh, 
but half the first day was all about just profiling an application and learning what it's actually doing. And that's just a, you know, a generic overview and actually trying to figure out how something works. But the developers have already done that because they're the ones that built it. They're going to be able to identify all those endpoints quickly. Uh, they're going to be able to write these tests a lot quicker than you are as well. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I say you are, but, you know, we've got a lot of developers in there. So in here. So you'll be able to write it a lot quicker than I will if I'm coming in and I don't have the knowledge. You know, you've got to create them, right? Chuck Norris does it all in a single assert, but the rest of us, it takes a little bit longer, and you know, we probably don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> and then we run the tests, right? Um, you know, one at a time and actually spin them up, and they need to complete quickly enough that we could push it into that CI CD pipeline. All right, hence the reason that, uh, you know, I've got this sputter project that I've created. Initially, it would just be, it was a uh, security payload unit test repository, um, but then it, it became more of a runner as we were starting to spin up these different applications and wanted to test them quickly and have a more generic runner that we were using that could talk to all of them. Now, you don't have to necessarily use this one to implement these tests. You can, you can pull your own payloads, you can create your own set, and I would recommend that you do that when you are creating your security integration tests. Uh, if you've already got a, a, a test runner in place, but this was an easy way for me to actually get it going and, uh, and have a custom runner for our applications. So it came about because we were building those intentionally vulnerable applications, and we needed to test multiple different frameworks and languages. We could run them all on, you know, Windows or you know whatever link whatever environment was the best for that application, but we could still test them properly and access all the different pieces that we wanted to. Um, the other thing that I ran into is that security payloads, like I said, flaws not exploits. Uh, security payloads are very exploit focused. Um, they're redundant and they produce false positives. If you think about a templating engine in your application and you've got like a main template that shows up a username and you've got cross-site scripting in that username field, but that template is used for you know, 400 different you know, kind of sub-templates. Sub sub yes, that's late, right? It's not, okay, yes, it's early, there we go. Well, we'll go the other way. Yeah, so other, so other pages use that template uh, a scanner like Burp Suite Pro or a dynamic scanner or even a lot of static analyzers will tell you, hey, guess what? We found 400 instances of cross-site scripting in your application. And you look at it and you're like, no, you found one. <clears throat> and you just wasted you know, probably two hours testing the same vulnerability over and over. And not only did you waste two hours, you tested cross-site scripting in 50, you know, or 60 different forms in that, on that one page. And even though it's like, you as a developer know that, you said, okay, and once you found it once, you could have moved on. And that's what we're gonna create with Sputter. We're gonna basically say, hey, we know the application, we know that the username field is input here, we make that change, we know it pops up in any one of these pages, we're gonna test like one or two of them, hey, it looks like we're not doing the proper you know, output encoding, we flag it, we move on, and you know we've still got web inspect that's running in the background for the next two days that's testing the same exact thing over and over. So that's what I'm saying about redundant. Uh, they produce those false positives because a lot of that would be false positives well, as well. And um, it speeds up this security integration into the SDLC because we are being very focused with our tests rather than being so expansive. Okay, <clears throat> story time. Right. What what is this symbol? It's, yep, yep. That's that's the actual name. You're right. <laughs> how how is it used? Where else do we see it? What's the common name? Yeah, it would be a hash. Yeah, it's a pound sign. Okay. Yes, I'm old. Okay, it's a pound sign. Um, so when I was in high school, this was you know like two years ago. Um, the, uh, the administration decided that they were going to implement a new system that would call your parents when, or would call parents when a student was absent or missing from class. 
And we still have these same systems nowadays, but this was a new, you know, this was a new technology that the school district was implementing. Uh, and it would just, you know, call out after, you know, at the end of the day after school was out and say, hey, your, your son or daughter has missed a class today. But, you know, we didn't necessarily like this. Um, but at the same time, the system itself had a number that you could call into and you could put in your phone number and would give you back these same messages. Um, and of course, being enterprising and young and not having anything else to do, we'd call in and we were just kind of playing around with it because it wouldn't let us actually clear those items, but it would tell you when it was, but it would still call. Um, but as we're playing with the numbers on the keypad, keypad, we hit the pound sign. What do you think happens when you hit the, hit the pound sign? Absolutely nothing. The story's over. Okay. Um, yeah, we get this nice little, oh, please enter an admin code. All right. So, you know, this was, again, two years ago. Uh, so this, uh, but uh, what do you think that, you know, how many digits do you think they thought was a secure admin code back? Four. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, uh, okay, to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate we have you know, five or six young geeks that have nothing to do every afternoon. We all have phones and we have a sheet of paper. So we sit down and we're like, huh, it would be interesting to see what we could actually do if we got into this admin section. And we, you know, you know, my friend Jason, he took 0000 to 2499. I took 2500 to 5000. Troy took, you know, the other one. And we spent one afternoon. How many hours do you think it took us to actually you know, crack that code? It was about two and a half, right? But we had nothing else to do that afternoon, so it was great. Um, but one of the options that it actually gave us was the ability to, you know, there was like, um, you know, update the system. It, it, you know, they had some like admin functionality in there, but the, the last one was reset the system, like do a, re, a hard reboot of the, of the system itself. Um, now, you know, we, we were very careful with this, but what happens to memory after you reset the system? Does it, it sticks around and... No, it's like everything that they load at three o'clock when school gets out actually gets flushed if you reboot it at 3.15. Um, not that I would know that or that we would ever do it because we had left, right? But, so why is this interesting? Why am I talking about this from a security, uh, security unit testing perspective? What's interesting about that? That it was a single character to, that actually caused that error to occur. Like we didn't have to do a full exploit to know that we were that there was some problem with the application, right? This would be called a kind of an access control vulnerability, right? You know, a bunch of kids sitting around shouldn't be able to access the administration site. They shouldn't even be able to get the login prompt to get into the administration site. Uh, but us finding that single character was enough of an indication to the administration or to the developer that there was a problem and that it needed to be fixed. And so we're gonna, we're gonna take that same approach when we're doing our security unit tests. We're gonna, I think we already talked about that, no. Yeah, we're gonna use that same approach, but we're gonna use that, uh, you know, we're gonna look for the flaws that exist and um, use as minimal, like, a minimal amount of characters to identify the flaws. Uh, like we know the behavior of the application, we're the developers, we know what's, what it's gonna happen if there is a flaw with it, and if it is, we're gonna, we're gonna in, take a note and then we're gonna move on. Okay. The cur current security payload environment is around those exploitable flaws and actually exploiting them completely, uh, and it's all about false positive reduction because they want to say, all right, there's a flaw that's here, uh, or they might, there might be a flaw, but I'm going to test every single one of those XSS payloads so that I know which ones are valid and which, one, which ones aren't. As a, again, as a developer, I care about the flaws, not the exploits, so if there was any sort of a problem, I just want to know about it and go to my you know, fixing phase. Um, the, yeah, They're more focused on the application response than the input, uh, as a developer, I'm more focused on the input that I'm getting in than I am necessarily the application response. If we take a look at the fuzz list from FuzzDB, does anybody, is, does anybody know what FuzzDB is? What is it?
Yeah, it can trigger a bug, a vulnerability. Like, uh, you know, in this case, this is XSS payloads. Um, but if we look through this, I mean, this is only 16 of them, but there's something, you know, there's a few hundred XSS payloads that are in there that actually, you know, it's, it's a good list. If I'm, if I'm doing like a perp, burp assessment and I'm concentrating on cross-site scripting, I'm gonna load these up to actually test it um, because I don't know the application. But if I know the application, what are the interesting characters that are here? It's the first one, right? That's the only one I really care about. So of these 16, how many tests do I really need to run to know whether or not there, there's a vulnerability here? Right, I'm gonna cut it. Yeah, it's down to like, what, four is that, right? A quote, maybe a space, um, a double quote, percent sign. Like, I don't even need to do the full character. I just know that if any of those get reflected back, that I've got a problem with cross-site scripting. So I don't need to, I don't need to use that full fuzz DB list. I just need to use those four characters. So the sputter payloads, they can generate all of these different, uh, like I've done analysis you know, on the FuzzDB list um, and we can generate the different characters that we, we are interested in for the different vulnerabilities. It eliminates those redundant testing of the same sequences. Here's an example of an XSS payload from Sputter. So from that example we looked at previously, um, I mean, we're just using indicators on either side to make sure that we know that that came from Sputter as we're looking at the response data to validate whether or not it's vulnerable. Um, yeah, so we'll actually get to a demo now. I know we're, we're pushing it up maybe a little bit on time. I can take as long as I like. Oh, oh, okay. So we're gonna go really slow. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, like this is a simple test. Um, you guys can see that okay, right? Uh, so, I wanted to actually show, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm interacting with an application, like this is a small Django application that's running on my, my system itself, uh, and I'm calling it just with, a, you know, one test. Um, it generates a list, a payload list for cross-site scripting. I'm doing verbose, so it's a little like over the top here because we're actually seeing everything that's being sent back and forth. Obviously, you know, Seth logs in with Soccer Lover because that's a super secure password because I all told you that I love, so wait, no, okay. Um, but you'll actually see the payloads as they're spitting out here um, that, you know, hey, there's the payload with the ampersand in it, in this case is not filtered for parameter Q. If we were to pull up, and that's on the search page, right, and maybe if we throw, let's take out the verbose header there. And we'll gen it'll generate a new set of payloads every time that we actually call it. Uh, we can store those, and the output file will actually tell you what it is. So if you, act if you see payloads in different places that you didn't test for, in the case of like burp or something like that, you can still, you know, hey, this is something that came from Sputter versus something else. Uh, but in general, you know, Sputter is not built to be a dynamic scanner, right? We're not, you know, attempting to do any sort of web spidering or anything like that. We'll see the configuration file here in a minute, uh, but the whole idea is that we know what the application is, we know that search only takes a Q item per, or a Q parameter, and we know that you know, it's not filtered because we threw those different parameters or those different payloads at it. So that's payload generation. I mean, that's pretty simplistic, pretty easy to do. Uh, the test generation, uh, it will build out a short, a small JSON file for you, uh, depending on the, the language that you're, or the framework of the application that you're targeting. Uh, but you still have to do a, a fair bit amount of, a fair amount of work to build your tests into that JSON uh, and configuration. Um, it's just a starting point for the unit test creation, but you don't necessarily, it's very, it's language agnostic. It's just JSON. It's not, you know, Python or Swift or any of the other languages. If you want to do it in those languages, you can as well. But you still have to map, it just maps which parameters and tests apply to which endpoints. 
Let's take a look. Let's see. So in this case, I you know if I you know I know it's a Django application. Here, you know, there's the code for it. That's where it exists. I'm going to actually output it as you know test.json. It'll generate a small file to kick me off um, and actually get me going on creating those tests. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. All right, so here's here's the example of you know what it actually pulls up and the configuration. I mean, we could we could create this. It's all JSON right now. I'm probably going to do some YAML as well. Create a, a you know so it'll understand YAML because everyone seems to forget commas and semicolons and whatever else with with JSON. Um, and yeah, we all yeah we all love to make those problems for ourselves. Um, but realistically, all it does is it's telling the, telling Sputter how the how to interact with the applications, you know, credentials that are being used. If there is some sort of CSR CSRF pattern that needs to that it needs to um, input into each of the requests, uh, the domain, the endpoints, uh, and you'll see this all on the Sputter uh, GitHub page, the README as well. It'll tell you exactly how you need to interact with the application. Uh, but you can generate what uh, a template fairly easily. Uh, okay, so a full-blown test. Uh, this is a consistent way to test multiple applications built on different languages and frameworks. It requires just tweaks to the configuration file to actually output it. Uh, it's, it's faster than running something like, uh, you know, like Burp Suite Scanner because of those techniques that we've talked about. Uh, callable from, you know, any sort of uh, CI-CD pipeline. And it should decrease the cost of running those unit tests. You've got a better... You've got better coverage. You can actually, you know, you know what you've tested and you know where it's at in your application because you've interacted with the developers or you are the developer and you've created it. So here's a demo. This is the payload demo. Okay, so I'm running a, an application locally here. Uh, it's called the Vulnerable Task Manager. Those of you that were in my code review course are familiar with this. You know, Seth, Software Lover. It's just a simple application, but it becomes interesting. Like, you can tell that I've run this a couple times against it already because I've, you know, I have hundreds of these project titles. All of a sudden, they're in here. Um, some, are, some may or may not be interesting. They may, ha may have the payloads in them. There's obviously a payload that was submitted with it, um, but let's run it again here really quick. <clears throat> so all we have to do is, you know, it's simple con uh, command uh, structure uh, on the command line. You know, we tell it where we want the results to go. We tell it where we're actually pulling the configuration from, and what we want to do is run the test currently. And this one, I think we're uh, running, I, we're probably testing about 15 or 20 different endpoints, and I'm not threaded right now, because you know, it goes you know, too fast when I do that. Um, but, you know, you'll see things like, okay, we're looking for auth control, where SQL injection, uh, the cross-site scripting test, that was not filtered for any of those. Um, it may take a little bit of time to actually configure this for your application, because you have to, you do have to go through each endpoint. Um, we were talking about some ways to speed that up, to use something like Django show URLs to pull the different endpoints out and throw them into the configuration file. But there is going to be some manual setup for you to actually do it, just like it would be with any integration test. Uh, you could throw it at your, at this point, you could throw it at your QA team as opposed to your development team to actually do write the write the test for it. But it may make more sense to actually take those payloads and start throwing those at the QA testers as opposed to you know using a new uh, a new test runner or a new you know testing tool. Um, and you'll see interesting things like this, right? You know, we've got some SQL injection test here, um, and you know, 26 of 52 passed. Uh, there's errors that occur. Uh, if if something happens with the application that Sputter didn't intend, it'll actually log that and it'll drop it into the output, but it doesn't necessarily say, hey, this is vulnerable to SQL injection. It just looks like there was a different error that occurred. That may or may not lead to SQL injection, but you should probably know about it, uh, hence the reason that it's actually calling it out. 
All right, and it's, it's not going super fast right now, but I do have some output here that we can take a look at so you can see what it looks like. Uh, VTM results in this case, uh, you know, there's the search endpoint, you know, get it past the SQL injection tests, but it failed the cross-site scripting test. Um, and then you can also find some of the, uh, there's a lot of cross-site scripting in here. Huh? Uh, there'll be auth ones. Uh, there's, okay, so here's like a SQL injection test that failed, right? But the only one that failed, there's what, four or five different SQL injection tests. The only one that caused a failure was the single quote, right? Um, and it also caused an unknown error when it came to XSS because the SQL injection test is actually looking for database errors where XSS is like, hey, I'm not sure quite, I'm not quite sure what happened here, but I put a single quote in there and something happened that I didn't intend, but I didn't see it reflected back out. So maybe you should go look into that, right? So there's indications there to actually help you along if you are a, a developer or a security tester about the problems that exist with the application. Where are we at? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it from a demo perspective. Sputtering into the future, like there's more things that I want to actually, like I want to speed it up even further. We've been playing with threading like I've been saying. Uh, further payload options. If you've got other fuzz DBs or anything like that that would, would help you know, expand those, those lists, let me know. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Seth Law. Uh, generation, the automated analysis, like I was saying, maybe a Burp Suite Pro plugin so I could, I could suck in what Burp already knows about an endpoint and actually create the payloads based off of that, create the configuration, um, more languages and frameworks, you know, the more that I test it against, the better it gets, obvious, obviously. Okay, so the summary of what we've talked about today, I know it's been a lot, and, you know, unit testing is a super interesting, you know, topic. Uh, that um, current security testing tools are great at finding and exploiting some vulnerabilities, but not all of them. Uh, we can do a better job at testing for security issues by being smart about it. That's realistically what it is, right? Let's find flaws, not exploits, and use Sputter if you want to, right? In your DevOps pipeline, it doesn't matter to me either way, uh, but you could, like, we can all do a better job and we can secure our code. Okay. That was a lot. I just dumped it all on you. So, any questions? <clears throat> nope. Okay. Oh, we do. Yes. Uh, does the thumbnail version support running code? Uh, it does, like Sputter will. Um, uh, so, we looked at some of that code before, and that was very specific to ASP.NET. I think it was MVC, I can't remember, 4.5 or something like that, that we were building the application is in. But like I, I've run Sputter against Node or .NET Core, right? You just have to spin up the application and then you can throw Sputter at it as long as you know where all those endpoints are. So, yep. Any other questions? Yeah, we'll be round of applause for a sec. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.